Hey folks, uh, this is Dr. White. I'm going to be taking you through uh, the solution for number one on page 34 of the new Oxford IB chemistry book. This is your classic problem of uh, determining the uh, formula of a compound. Okay, in this case we have a, it looks like we have a hydrated salt. Okay, Epsom salt. Okay. Um, so, if we look at the first part, which is A, it says calculate the mass, in grams of course, uh, of water from the sample. Okay, and when they give us uh, the table of data, um, they say the mass of the dish is 24.10 grams. They say uh, the mass of the dish plus our hydrate is 26.60 grams and the uh, mass of our dish after heating okay, is 25.32 grams. This prob would probably be, of course be our MgSO4 without the water, right, after driving off the water. So the question is, um, calculate in grams the water evaporated from the sample. Well, we've got the mass of the hydrate here and the mass of the dehydrated compound here. If we just subtract those, we should be able to find that out. So 26.60 minus 25.32. If we do our calculation, we get... 1.28 grams of water evaporated. That would be B. And if we want to turn that into moles, we need to divide by the molar mass in one mole of water. There is 18.0 grams. So there, in total, there's 0 0.0711 moles of water evaporated. Okay, now if we focus on uh, the MgSO4, uh, letter C, calculate the mass in grams of MgSO4. Well, that's going to be our mass of our dish after, right? Subtract out the mass of the dish before. We got 1.22 grams of MgSO4. Well, we want to get some moles, right? Moles of MgSO4. Per one mole of MgSO4, how many grams is there? Well, you may have to do a quick calculation here. Let's do that. So Mg, you're going to have to look up your periodic table. Mg is 24.3 grams per mole. Sulfur is 32. Actually, it's 32.1, I believe. And if we have four oxygens in there, we're going to get 64 grams per mole. So in the end, it's 0 0.40120. Okay, so it's 120.4 grams per mole. If we divide by that, we get 0 0.0101 moles of MgSO4. Okay, this would be uh, oops, not B, but D. And then E asks us to calculate the ratio of MgSO4 to H2O. Well, I'm going to do the ratio of H2O to MgSO4 because I think that's easier to understand. 
if we take the number of moles of water divided by the number of moles of MgSO4, you're going to get, it's about 7.04 moles of water for every one mole of MgSO4. Okay, so the ratio is 7 to 1 water to magnesium sulfate. Well, what does that mean? It means that for letter F, if we're going to write out our formula for MgSO4 hydrate, it's going to look like this. Mg, I lost my, MgSO4 dot 7 hydrates. The name of that would be magnesium sulfate heptahydrate. So we're doing number two from page 34 in uh, the new Oxford IB chemistry book. This is a, another problem where we're trying to figure out the uh, formula of a compound. This one's a little bit more complicated than number one, so we got to take this step by step. Okay, So A, it asks us to figure out the amount in moles of barium sulfate and 1.17 grams of precipitate. So if we've got 1.17 grams of precipitate, how many moles is that? Well, we know, how to, we know how to figure that out if we just divide by the molar mass. Let's go ahead and tally that up real quick. Barium is 137.33 grams per mole. Sulfur is 32.1 grams per mole, and if we have four oxygens, we're looking at 64 grams per mole. Let's go ahead and add those up. We're looking at 233.4 grams per mole of barium sulfate. Okay, so if we do this calculation, we're looking at 5.01 times 10 to the negative 3 moles of barium sulfate. Okay, that would be the answer to A. Let's go ahead and take a look at B. Calculate the amount in moles of sulfate in 0.982 grams of the compound. Well, if we've got 5 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of barium sulfate, that wouldn't it mean that we have 5.01 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of sulfate in the original compound that we dissolved? Right, it's the total amount of sulfate, and that hasn't changed whether we dissolved it or we precipitated it. So that's the answer to B. C, calculate the amount in moles of iron in 0.982 grams of the compound. Well, if we know that we have 5 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of sulfate, and if we look at the formula for the compound, we know the ratio of sulfate to iron, right? We know that there are two sulfates per one iron. That looks like we're looking at iron uh, two here, right? I'm getting this from the I'm getting this from the formula. So iron ammonium sulfate and then there's some amount of water but this two means that there's two sulfates per one iron so I'm gonna have 
2.5 1 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of iron. That's the answer to C. D wants to find the number of grams of various things. So let's go ahead and do that. D. So how many grams of iron are there? Well, we know how many moles of iron there are. Let's just turn that to grams. So 2.51 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of iron. Multiply by that by the molar mass of iron. In one mole there are I always forget iron. Iron is 55.8. We get 0 0.140 grams of iron. Okay, it also asks for ammonium. Okay, well, we can figure out how many moles of ammonium we have too, right? If there are two, let's go back here to our, to our sulfate calculation. If I've got this much sulfate, right, I'm sorry, that should be sulfate. I just have to multiply the, by the ratio of ammonium to sulfate, which is two ammoniums per two sulfates. All right, and that's just one to one. So I have the same amount of moles of ammonium as I do sulfate. Okay, so that's, uh, I'm going to use my number for ammonium. Multiply by the molar mass, right? We're looking at uh, ammonium real quick is 14 plus 4, 1. So, so that would be 18 grams. We're looking at 0.09. Zero two grams of ammonium. And if I look at three for part D, we're looking at sulfate. We just multiply the amount of sulfate times the mass of sulfate. I'm just going to do that real quick. 32 plus 64, we're looking at uh, per one mole, we're looking at 90 six grams per mole or 0.48 grams of sulfate. So now we have the amount of grams in each of each component minus the water of our compound. So let's figure out how many moles of water are going to be present in our compound. Well, I'm going to, have to put E over here. Well, so if we have 0.982 grams of compound, if we subtract out the iron, if we subtract out the ammonium, if we subtract out the sulfate, we'll be left with the water. And we have 0 0.271 grams of water. If we turn that into moles, right, divide by the molar mass, we have 0 0.0, we have 0 0.0150 moles of H2O now for the last step, F, determine the amount in moles of the compound and hence the value of X. Well, if we know that we have 0 0.150 moles of water and let's compare it to iron, 2.5 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of iron, now we'll get our ratio. So let's do water 
compare that with our iron, we get a ratio of six. Six waters per one iron. Well, what does that mean? That means in our final compound, we're going to have Fe, NH4, SO4, two of those, and six waters. Okay, so here, uh, number eight, looks like we're dealing with a limiting reagent problem. Uh, first, let's write down the uh, chemical equation. Copper one oxide plus copper two sulfide reacts to form six coppers and SO2. It looks like we're going to need two copper one oxides there. Um, now, the for question A, it asks us to determine the limiting reagent of this reaction. Well, to do that, we need to fill out our before change after table, right? And we need to know how much of each of these uh, reactants, copper one oxide, copper one sulfide, that we're dealing with. So um, the question gives us kilograms. Let's turn the kilograms into moles. So 10,000 grams, right? 10,000 grams is the same as 10 kilograms. 10,000 grams of copper one oxide, if we divide by the molar mass, one mole, one mole of copper one oxide is 143 grams. That gives us 69.9 moles of copper one oxide. Copper two sulf or copper one sulfide, um, 5,000 grams of that. If we divide it by 159 grams per mole, we get 31.4 moles of copper one sulfide. So we can put this into our BCA table now. Now we have to figure out which one is the limiting reagent. The way to do that is by picking one value. I'm going to pick the 31.4 moles and ask myself, if I react all of that 31.4 moles, how much of the other reactant am I going to need? Well, the ratio of copper one oxide to copper one sulfide for the reaction is two to one. So if I'm going to react 31.4 of my copper two sulfide, I'm going to need 62.8 moles of copper one oxide. The question is, do I have 62.8 moles? And the, and the answer is yes, I've got more than that. So copper one sulfide will be my limiting reagent. That means all of it's going to react. And then I'm going to react 62.8 moles of copper one oxide. That's twice that of my copper one sulfide. Okay, quick subtraction. I'm going to be left with 7.1 moles. Um, so the limiting reagent is going to be copper one sulfide. And then uh, calculate the maximum mass of copper that could be obtained from these masses of reactants. Well, we just got to finish filling out our uh, BCA table. Um, I start out with zero copper, right? Now, if I react 31.4 moles of copper one sulfide, for every one of those, I'm going to get six coppers. So if I multiply 31.4 by six, I'm going to end up with 189 moles of copper, six times uh, 31.4 moles. Now, if I want mass, I've got to actually um, convert that into mass. So if I have 189 moles of copper and I multiply by the molar mass, which is 63.5, I get roughly 12,000 grams of copper, which is also equal to 12 kilograms of copper. And that's my answer. Okay, number nine from uh, topic one from the new Oxford IB chemistry book. These are the questions in the back of the chapter. Um, looks like we are going to figure out the percentage by mass and the relative molecular mass of a compound. So organic compound A contains 62% of 
by mass carbon, 24.1% by mass nitrogen, the remainder being hydrogen. Let's figure out the percentage by mass of hydrogen in the empirical formula for A. Okay, well, um, the first step to these problems is always to assume 100 grams. And if you do that, then the percentage is turned into grams. So 62% carbon, right? Oh, again, we're trying to figure out what the molecular formula is for this compound. So if it's 62% carbon, that means it's going to be 62 grams of carbon. If I have 24.1% nitrogen, then it's going to be 24.1 grams of nitrogen. Now it says the balance is going to be hydrogen. So 62 plus 24, uh, that's 86.1. So we're looking at 13.9% 13, 13 hydrogen. So now we're looking at 13.9 grams of hydrogen. Okay, second step, always convert to moles. If we want to get to moles, we've got to divide by the molar mass. So 12 grams of carbon per mole, 14 grams of nitrogen per mole, and 1 gram of hydrogen per mole. I get 5.17 moles of carbon, 1.72 moles of nitrogen, and 13.9 moles of hydrogen, okay? Now, what we do is we divide the third step, divide by lowest number of moles. So we're gonna divide each of these numbers by 1.72, Okay, that's going to give us a relative ratio of three carbons, one nitrogen, and eight hydrogens. So my empirical formula will be C3NH8. Okay, B, relative molecular mass, we're just going to add the the weights up, so 3 times 12, 1 times 14, and 8 times 1. So the relative molecular mass of this empirical formula would be 58 grams per mole. Then they want to say that if the molecular mass is 116, then what's the molecular formula? Well. To find the molecular formula, it's basically some number that you multiply, right, the empirical for, or the empirical formula by to figure out what the true molecular formula is. So it's some ratio bigger than the simplest ratio, which is the empirical formula. If you take the mass of the molecular formula and divide it by the mass of the empirical formula you're going to get a factor that you multiply your empirical formula by, which is 2. So if I multiply the 2 by the numbers in my empirical formula, I get C6N2H16. So this is my empirical formula on top. This is my molecular formula on the bottom. Going over number 10 on page 35 of the new Oxford IB chemistry book, uh, looks like we've got a uh, combination of a empirical formula and a PV equals NRT problem here. Let's go ahead and uh, get started. Remember, first step, convert percent to mass. Okay, you do that by assuming 100 grams so if something is 53.8% nitrogen, if there's 100 grams of it, that means there's 53.8 grams of nitrogen 
in the compound. 46.2% carbon. That means there's going to be 46.2 grams of carbon. Of course, we've got to turn those into moles. We've got to divide by the molar mass. Nitrogen's going to be 14.0 grams per one mole. Carbon's going to be 12.0 grams per one mole. A little quick math says that we've got 3.84 moles of nitrogen and about the same amount of carbon. So if we, if we want to find the ratio, we divide by the lowest 3.84 divided by 3.84 and we figure out that we indeed have a one to one ratio of nitrogen to carbon. That means our empirical formula is CN. Now it goes on to give us some gas conditions, but my hunch is, is that we're going to have to figure out the molar mass of the actual uh, molecular compound. So let's go ahead and do that. Remember, uh, PV equals NRT. And N, right, you can actually figure that out. N is going to be the uh, grams of something divided by the molar mass. So you can plug that in. So let's change the form of this to PV equals mass times RT over molar mass. And then of course the question is asking us to find molar mass, so then molar mass is going to be equal to MRT over PV. So now we just got to figure out, just got to plug in, plug in our numbers. So mass is going to be, the problem says 1.048 grams. R is 8.31 joules per mole Kelvin and T is going to be in Kelvin 273 all over pressure we are at 1.01 .01 times 10 to the 5 Pascals and our volume looks like it's uh, remember we're going to turn volume into meters squared. I'll go do that over here. So if we have 462 centimeters cubed, that's going to be equal to 0 0.000462 meters cubed or 4.62 times 10 to the minus 4 meters cubed. Okay, we have to do that because uh, we've got joules in our um, ideal gas constant and that's what's going to cancel out the joules. Okay, so um, cancel out, we've got grams, joules is going to cancel out uh, pascals and meters cubed, uh, kelvins is going to cancel out, and what we're going to be left with is grams per mole, which is what we want. So let's plug it in. If we plug all this in, we get 50.1 grams per mole. Okay, that's for our molecular compound. Now, if we want to figure out the, uh, the factor by which we need to multiply our empirical formula by, we need the molar mass of the empirical formula, which is 12 plus 14. I'm getting 26 grams per mole. Divide 50.1 grams per mole, which is the molar mass of the compound, by 26 grams per mole. That's going to equal 1.95. That's about 2. Okay, so there's 2. Uh, the, the factor that we're going to multiply our empirical formula by is 2. So 
that means that our molecular form was going to be C2N2. Okay, number 11, this is your typical gravimetric analysis problem. Uh, we're on page 35 of the new Oxford IV chemistry book. Um, it says, uh, an oxide of copper was reduced in a stream of hydrogen. Um, let's go ahead and just write out that um, reaction, because maybe not a lot of people will understand what's actually happening. If you don't understand what's happening, it's hard to do the problem. So yeah, we have some um, compound, right, copper oxide. We're not sure how many oxygens are with that copper. And we're going to react it with H2 gas. Okay, this is a reduction of copper. That means we're going to make copper metal and water. Okay. Um, now, if we know how much we're making, uh, then we can figure out how much oxygen we actually started with and figure out what that uh, ratio is. So the problem gives us some, uh, some data to work with. So we start off with um, the mass of the dish that the reaction is completed in. That's 13.0.80 grams. Uh, we start off with the mass of dish with reactants. Right? That's the um, CuO, right? And that is 21.0. 75 grams and then we've got the mass of dish uh, after heating right that's gonna have our product after heating I can't write today uh, we've got 20.15 um, that's actually by the just an aside that's actually where the name reduction comes from it comes from the fact that when we reduce a uh, metal oxide, we actually reduce its mass because we take it from an oxide to just the elemental metal. So just a little factoid there for you. Uh, the problem kind of takes us through the steps and they, they kind of help us along here. Uh, it says, uh, A says, explain why the stream of hydrogen gas was maintained until the apparatus was cooled. Okay, um, we actually want to keep the H2 gas running because um, if you have hot copper product if you let oxygen back in there it can react with uh, oxygen in atmosphere so you don't want any at oxygen to come into contact with the hot copper because you're just going to get back to your reactants B Calculate the empirical formula of the oxide of copper using the data above. Okay, so it kind of wants us to calculate that. We just got to uh, remember how to do these gravimetric analysis problems. So um, the the basic idea here is that if you have the um, mass of the copper oxide minus the mass of just the copper that's going to equal the mass of the oxygen, right? And then you can turn those into moles and figure out what the ratio is. So let's go ahead and do that. So mass of copper is going to be 21.75 minus 13.80. Okay, do a little bit of math here. Point 0.9. Right, and then uh, 20 minus 7, we got 7.95 grams of copper oxide. Okay, let's figure out what our mass of copper is. That's going to be uh, 21.75, which is the mass of the, the dish. Wait a minute, hold on. 21.75, 20.15. Nope, sorry, got that wrong. 20.15, which is the mass of the dish with the reactants, minus the original mass, we're going to get 5, 6.35 grams of copper. If we subtract 6.35 from 7.95, we're going to get 1.60 grams of oxygen. Okay, so 
Now the last step is to actually get find the moles of copper and the moles of oxygen, and then we're going to have our uh, ratio. So um, moles of copper is simply going to be 6.35 grams of copper times the molar or divided by the molar mass, which is 63.5. Oh, look at that. They're going to make it easy on us. We've got point one moles of copper. Uh, moles of oxygen, looks like they're going to make this easy on us as well. We've got 1.60 grams of oxygen divided by the molar mass, 16 grams per mole. And look at that, we've got 0.1 moles of oxygen. So if the ratio of copper is 0.1 and oxygen is 0.1, that means we have a one-to-one -one ratio of copper to oxygen. That means our empirical formula is going to be CuO. Does anybody know the name of this compound, CuO? This would, of course, be copper 2 oxide. Okay. Oh, right, an equation for the reaction that occurred. Looks like we did that. So we got C. A, B is right here. Uh, state two changes that would be observed inside the tube as it is heated. D. Well, um, we're going to make uh, copper metal, right? So um, copper oxide is like a green color. Copper is that kind of brownish color. So inside the metal is going to turn from green to brown. Okay. Um, and we're also going to have a reduction in mass. So it looks so it looks like the the solid should get smaller. Okay, if you have any other suggestions for uh, changes, go ahead and put those in the comments. Okay, finishing up number uh, page, page number 35. We're on number 12 here. Um, we've got another uh, experiment where we are trying to figure out the empirical formula of a compound. It looks like this is a recurring theme in the new IV chemistry curriculum for 2016. Here we go. Talks about a, um, I'll just write out the reaction here real quick. An alkali metal sulfate. Okay, so we're talking about a metal. Actually, let me put this um, M. An alkali metal. So we know that the charge is going to be plus one and we know that it's a sulfate so it's going to be charged and that's two minus just keep that in mind we're, we're turning this we're reacting this, this with um, barium and we're making BASO4 right and then looks like we got a double replacement reaction our metal plus our chloride Okay, so that's all we really know at this point, but we can figure this out as we go. Uh, so number A, calculate the amount in moles of barium sulfate formed. Well, that should be fairly easy. If we get point, 0.672 grams of barium sulfate, if we multiply that or divide that by the molar mass, right, we should be able to find the number of moles of barium sulfate. I'm going to need to uh, do this quick calculation here. So barium is 137.3. Sulfate, sulfur is going to be 32.0. And oxygen, if I got four of them, it's going to be 64.0. If we add those up, 0.3, 9, 3, Carry the one, 233.3. I feel like I've calculated that before per mole.
quick iPhone calculation gives us two point eight eight times ten to the minus three moles of barium sulfate. So there you go. There's your number of moles of barium sulfate for A. B, determine the amount in moles of the alkali metal sulfate present. Okay. Well, if it's an alkali metal sulfate, then we know that an alkali metal is going to be a plus one charge. Sulfate is going to be minus two. So we know that sulfate is always going to have a ratio of one to our alkali metal sulfate because um, the metals, this might be one or two or three, but sulfate is always going to be one. So let's, uh, that means we know the number of moles of the alkali metal sulfate. It's the, simply the same as the number of moles of barium sulfate. Okay. Now it says determine the molar mass of the alkali metal sulfate and state its units. Well, this kind of goes back to the, the problem that we did earlier. Um, we've got our moles of sulfate, right? We've got 2.88 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of sulfate. I'm going to go ahead and turn that into grams. Sulfate is, of course, 96 grams per mole. We've got 0.277 grams of sulfate. But we also know that our original amount of alkali metal sulfate is 0 0.502 right so if we subtract out the weight of the sulfate then we're going to get the mass of the metal so we've got 0 0.225 grams of our alkali metal. Okay, so it says determine the molar mass of the alkali metal sulfate. Well, if we have the moles and we have the grams, right, 0 0.502 grams of our alkali metal sulfate, divide that by the number of moles, 2.88 times 10 to the minus 3 moles, we get 174.5 three grams per mole. That is the molar mass of our uh, alkali metal sulfate. Deduce the identity of the alkali metal showing your workings. Well, let's go ahead and do that. Uh, so if we're on D, well if we know the molar mass of the alkali metal sulfate and we know the molar mass of sulfate we should be able to kind of figure this out just by looking at the periodic table. So um, this is the alkali metal sulfate. I'm going to subtract out the molar mass of sulfate. Okay, and that's going to leave me with uh, seventy-eight point three, I believe. grams per mole. Okay, now remember that the 78.3, there has to be two of whatever the alkali metal is in our formula. So if we divide this by two, we get 39.15 grams per mole for our whatever our alkali metal is. Well, this is pretty close to potassium. So our formula for alkali metal sulfate is going to be K2SO4. 
right? Because we knew there was going to be two of them in there. So now we need to write an equation. Let's go ahead and update our equation that we wrote originally. So E, we've got K2SO4, potassium sulfate, plus barium chloride is going to yield potassium chloride plus barium sulfate, right? And this, is, of course, is going to be solid. KCL is going to be aqueous. Let's just balance this for uh, posterity put a two in there we are done okay we're on number 13 this is on page 36 of the new Oxford IB chemistry textbook these are the questions at the end of topic one uh, looks like we're doing a uh, acetylation of uh, salicylic acid let's go ahead and just draw out that uh, reaction here this is taking me back to my organic chemistry days Okay, this one is salicylic acid. Um, we're going to react it with acetic anhydride. Very reactive substance, a little acid catalyst, and uh, we're going to end up with an acetylated benzene ring. Okay, this is another name for this would be aspirin. And the byproduct is acetic acid. So there's a reaction. Um, the uh, problem gives us some data. It says uh, mass of salicylic acid used is 3.15 gives us a little bit of uncertainty there. Plus or minus 0.02 grams. Uh, the mass of aspirin after purification is 2.50 plus or minus 0 0.2 grams. Okay, and then it starts asking us questions, wanting us to solve it. Determine the amount in moles of salicylic acid used. Okay, well we can do that. Uh, so A, mass, or the moles of salicylic acid. Let's take the mass of salicylic acid, 3.15 grams and we're going to divide that by the molar mass of salicylic acid. Okay, the question is, what is the molar mass of salicylic acid? I'm going to have to go ahead and calculate this. Mass of salicylic acid is 138 grams per mole. So we're looking at uh, 0 0.0228 moles of salicylic acid. Next one, calculate the theoretical yield in grams of aspirin. Well, okay, we need to look at our, uh, our reaction here. So there's one salicylic acid per one um, acetic anhydride. We know there's one mole of uh, ethanoic anhydride per one mole of salicylic acid. So it's going to be 0 0.00228 moles of ethanoic anhydride. So we know that we're going to have one mole of aspirin per one mole of salicylic acid. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just let's do this all in one shot here. It's going to want theoretical yield. That's going to be in grams. So grams of aspirin per moles of aspirin. We have 180 grams. If we work this out, we come out to 4.10 grams of aspirin that's the theoretical yield. That's how much we're supposed to get if we get 100% uh, yield. Determine the percentage yield of pure aspirin. So percent yield, of course, is your actual over theoretical. 
and then multiply that by 100. So our actual looking up back at, up at the problem is 2.50 grams. What we're supposed to get is 4.10 grams. Multiply that by 100. We're looking at a 61%. So state the number of significant figures associated with the mass of the pure aspirin obtained and calculate the percentage uncertainty associated with this mass. Well, if we've got three significant figures here, so we've got the answer is three significant figures, and if we want to figure out the percent uncertainty, then it's going to be 0 0.02 divided by 2.50 times 100. We're looking at 0.8% uh, uncertainty, close to 1. And then lastly, uh, another student repeated the experiment, obtained an experimental yield of 150%. Teacher checked the calculation and found no errors. Comment on the result. Well, if you've ever done this uh, experiment, you know you need to uh, filter it. So when you filter it, you might not have dried the product properly. Not dried properly. Okay, you might not have washed it properly. Or enough. These are two big reasons why uh, typically you see products with uh, more than 100% yield it's typically either wet or it's got some extra stuff in it. Okay, number 14 on page 36. We're in the, uh, the new Oxford IB Chemistry Curriculum book. Uh, the, uh, we're talking about uh, brass and a way to analyze the uh, amount of copper in brass. And there's three uh, equations that they give you in the book. Step one, step two, step three. I'm not going to write these out here, but uh, just know that they're there. Okay. They also give you a table with, uh, looks like they're doing a uh, titration to figure out uh, the amounts of the different reactants. Uh, I, the first part, asks uh, calculate the average amount in moles of the um, S2032 minus in step three. All right, so how much did we add of S2032 minus? Well, it says the average volume added is 28.50. 28.50 centimeters cubed. Let's go turn this to decimeters cubed. In one decimeter cube, there's a thousand centimeters cubed. And then we're going to multiply by the concentration. So it's 0 0.100 moles per decimeter cubed. So we added 2.85 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of thiosulfate. Calculate the amount in moles of copper present in brass. Okay, well, so we kind of have to backtrack here. And let's start with how much thiosulfate we added. They give us those three equations, and the reason why they give us those three equations so you can kind of backtrack and back out the uh, concentration of, or the number of moles of copper. Let's see if we can do that. Well, we know that we need um, two moles of thiosulfate per one mole of iodine. We also know that we're going to, one iodine is produced when we react two moles of the copper two plus. And then in the first equation, we get 
we use one mole of copper to give one mole of copper two plus. This is called dimensional analysis. The way you know you did it correctly is if you cancel out all the units. So thiosulfate, iodine cancels, copper two plus cancels, and in the end you get 2.85 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of copper. Okay, now it wants to know, calculate the mass of copper in brass. Okay, so all we'd have to do is take our amount of copper that is related indirectly to the amount of uh, thiosulfate. Just multiply by the molar mass, 63.5 so in order to find the mass of copper, we need to multiply the moles of copper, which is 2.85 times 10 to the minus 3, times the molar mass of copper as found in the periodic table. If we multiply those, we get 0 0.181 grams of copper in the sample. Okay. Now, uh, what's the percentage by mass of the copper in the brass? Well, if we take the amount of the copper and put it over the total amount of brass, which is, and we multiply by 100, we get a percentage of 39.7%. Now, the company says that the uh, total amount of brass or total amount of copper in the sample is 44.2%, right? This is our theoretical value. If we take our the theoretical minus the actual over the theoretical. So we are at 10.2% error.